Very good morning to all. We're pleased to have all of you here with us this morning. I am Anton Thayalan, the Chief Evangelist for Luminary Learning Solutions, and I will be the voice of the webinar this morning. We welcome you to the finale of Reset and Go webinar series, which will augment the topics discussed over the past two weeks with a view of carving a clear way forward. Our disclaimer today is a bit different, seeing that it is the finale, and we have over the past 11 days discussed and looked at 11 topics with different viewpoints, different aspects to the end that we can draw a fruitful conclusion of our own, take from it what we may. Today, we are exploring these topics with humor, with somewhat of a slapstick approach even, <laughs> with little to no structure, and we will engage in an honest conversation, which at times I think would be pointed and make you raise your eyebrows and think, even rethink the assumptions and perceptions you currently hold. On that note, some ground rules this morning. As always, if you do wish to ask a question, please use the chat option at any given point during the session. The questions will be clubbed together and the format of the webinar will be fueled by your Q&A. The topic for the session this morning, thriving in chaos, lessons learned. Our guests for today are internationally acclaimed turnaround consultants. Gordon Treadgold, who has unique, who has a unique ability to assess difficult situations determine what could be done differently, and then create simple, easy to understand and easy to implement solutions, which deliver sustainable results fast. He is an award-winning corporate motivational speaker in the USA and ranked in the Global Gurus Top 10 Leadership Expert. He is a turnaround expert, having worked on three continents for Fortune 100 companies, leading global departments of over 1,000 staff, driving operational performance improvement programs and driving strategic change initiatives. Inc. Magazine ranks him as one of the top 100 leadership and management experts and speakers. Gordon is also ranked as number two on the top 15 must read leadership blogs. He is ranked 19 on top social media marketing influencers by CEO World Magazine. He is an acclaimed author who is, whose last book, Fast, was a finalist in Chartered Management Institute and Practical Management Book of the Year. Joining him this morning is Nigel Risner, also known as the Chief Zookeeper, entertaining and unreservedly direct. Don't I know it? Nigel is not just a motivational speaker. He's a company turnaround specialist driving everyone from CEOs to school children to ignite excitement and action in their life. For more than 20 years, his quest has inspired thousands of FTSE 100 and Fortune 500 delegates, school children, charity, prison inmates, in groups of five to 5,000 and all over the world. Nigel's words whip up listeners into action, energized and passionate. He is the only motivational speaker in Europe to have been awarded Speaker of the Year from both the Academy of Chief Executives and Vistage, formerly known as the Executive Committee. One of the younger CEOs of a financial service company in the city of London, his books, You Had Me At Hello, The New Rules for Better Networking, and It's a Zoo Around Here, The New Rules for Better Communication, have sold in the thousands and are literally transforming lives around the world. His latest book is Zookeeper Rules for the Office and the Impact Code. Our host this morning really needs no introduction, but nevertheless, it's Vidushan Nathavitharana, the founder and the destiny architect of High Five Consultancy and Luminary Learning Solutions. Thank you everyone for joining us this morning. Vidushan, over to you. Has he fallen off his chair? <laughs> we can't hear him. <laughs> um, so good morning, Gordon. Good morning, 
Nigel and um, good morning everyone. Um, haven't fallen off my chair just yet, but uh, let's hope I don't either. Uh, after having what certainly was a rollicking fun filled conversation with both of you yesterday, um, I took Gordon's advice to up my notes and the frameworks, <laughs> which I customarily do, um, and, decided, and decided to love myself, if I may say, use the words, the joy and the privilege of having a rather scary prospect of navigating this conversation based on your collective wisdoms and see where it goes. So for the audience who's listening in, we are at the conclusion of 11 rather detailed conversations about dealing with the immediate aftermath of COVID, but also more importantly, looking ahead. And covering these 11 topics ranged from HR to finance, leadership to emotional well-being, from communication to being fit. And my attempt today is to try and somehow weave all of these together and try and understand a common theme and try and get insights from both of you gentlemen um, who are coaches to some of the most successful and resourceful leaders in the world. So my attempt, and I stress on this, my attempt is to gain different perspectives, not answers per se. Each of us do have unique contexts. I saw this wonderful little meme that said we are not all in the same ship. The ships are different, but we are in the same sea facing the storm. Um, and I think that resonated with me this morning because I don't think we can all hope to find solutions here and now based on where we sit making assumptions. But what I do hope that we do today is to explore some pointed areas of focus and some hard questions that need some form of conversation around and some bone honest views um, and points which maybe resonates with all of you today. So before the conversation, when I was trying to make my notes, I did find that there was one common thread and this was something that both of you are experts in. Um, and I thought let's let's have a conversation around it because I think the importance of leadership in navigating through what seems new territory for all of us, I think was something that came up over and over and over again in every single webinar conversation that we had. So I thought let's anchor this on 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 that around leadership in all its forms, starting with ob obviously leading yourself uh, to leading teams to of course leading organizations and interweaving aspects like communication and well-being and working from home and all of these other areas um, into that conversation. So let's get on with it, shall we? So um, to start off with, I'm curious, Gordon, I'm going to throw this to you um, to start off with. Um, I always <coughs> throw this really cliche question whenever I do leadership programs, because I think it's always a good place to start, even though it's absolutely <coughs> packed. But but let's um, let's ask the audience to <coughs> patiently bear with us until we siphon this out because I think it is important to set context. And definitions I think are important because the definitions frame or reference and how we look at something. So I've been itching to ask you, um, Gordon, and then we'll move on to Nigel. Um, what is leadership um, and, and, and does it really matter that much? So uh, thank you for the awesome introduction and I've been looking forward to this uh, for a while. I, I know Nigel well and I know that we are going to have uh, some fun on this call. So let me let me start with that question. I'm going to keep it very brief and very simple. For me, leadership is fundamentally it's about putting your people and yourself in a position to be successful. It is no more, no less than that and as leaders that's our job so in a situation where we're going through a crisis that ability to put people in a position where they can succeed is crucial so that's my definition and my thought of its importance Nigel, you want to weigh in well i i thought the introductions were very very poor i thought mine would <laughs> be as long as gordon's and i knew <laughs> after seven minutes of his introduction <laughs> I wasn't ready for mine, you know. I thought, let's get going. Leadership is about being fair. And I didn't think you were fair. So I'll try to do the best I can, giving my explanation on leadership. In a really simple way, you lead people and you manage things. So if you're a leader and it involves people, your job is to be a leader. If you're a father or a mother, you're a leader. If you work in the Cubs, the Scouts, you're a leader. 
If you look after toilets, you look after computers, you look after a process that is management. And we need to understand there's a massive difference between leadership and management. Yeah. I think that that's a fantastic place to start. But um, and it begs the question, though, does it fundamentally look different in situations like this or does it by and large remain the same? Is leadership in a crisis different to leading under normal circumstances? It's really interesting to watch right now that most countries who are being led by women are thriving, are surviving, and their borders very are, are being closed very quickly. So Germany, Australia, New Zealand have a different system altogether than most of the other countries. So I'm going to be sexist in a way that most countries who are being led by women are doing a phenomenal job and leadership today has never been more important. And it's really showing up the difference between great leaders and leaders. Gordon will have yeah. a different thread on this, <laughs> but great leaders are showing up today. Yeah, so um, just just taking a, a little bit further forward what Nigel says, I actually find that uh, women invariably make as good, if not better leaders than uh, than men um, it, across the board. That's certainly my experience of some of the leaders that I've worked with and I'd, I'd worked for me. But yeah, I think I think leadership, it, it is different. There's a really good saying that is that anybody can captain uh, a, a ship when the sea is calm. And, and we see that with leaders who are a lot of leadership, certainly in politics, it's about sound bites. It's about it's about talking about policy and you, you create this great image and charisma. But in a crisis, none of that matters. It's about action. It's about taking the right action. It's about making the hard decisions. It's about doing the right things. It's about giving people belief and hope and faith that we'll get through this. And that's completely different. And, and we see that in, you know, in, in the US, the uh, one of the one of the best leaders I've seen at the moment, because I've seen a lot of his socks, Andrew Cuomo from New York. People talked about him before as being too abrupt, not a presidential candidate, um, difficult to get on with. Yet in this crisis, he's actually held up as the best leader in the US because he is taking action. He is making the difficult decisions and leadership does change depending on the circumstances. And we have to be a little bit more uh, dictatorial and a little bit less democratic because time is of the essence. We can't, you know, we can't just study there and get the opinions of a thousand people and then think, OK, right, let's take a vote on this. Sometimes we just have to take action. Um, I'd be a little bit more directive. The reason is he's the mayor of New York. He looks after he, one of the biggest states <coughs> in the world and he yep. knows he's got to step up and he's not yep. worried about a popularity contest. Correct. And that's what leadership's about. Not Correct. worrying about what you people think of you. It's doing the right thing. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And, and when there's no crisis, it's a popularity contest. When there's a crisis, it's about who can get stuff done. And I can I speak about champions in the workplace and the letter yeah. C of champions is all about character mm. and it really shows up in leadership people's character. So when you look at certain <coughs> presidents or certain prime ministers, their character is going to get remembered for years to come based on how they've handled this crisis compared to have I got an election coming up in November or what's yeah. happening in my relationships today. It's about your character and how you communicate, which is the other yeah. C of being a great champion. And that's what leaderships are. They're champions of the workplace. Yeah, okay, can I mean, because because I've been inundated ever since you mentioned this, um, I'm getting a string of messages across. Is this um, from men? Is this from men telling us we're wrong about women being good leaders? <laughs> No, this, is quite, just, this is just quite, Anton. This is just Anton's wife saying, "I told you so." <laughs> <laughs> Apart from all of that, I think, I think, I think there's a general consensus: numbers don't lie, right? So, yeah. Um, there is a whole string of questions, and I'll try and kind of capture the essence of it. What they're asking is, why is that so? Why, why are women leaders better adept 
at handling that situation then can I, is can I answer in a very gender or is it down to characteristics can i answer in a very simple way if you go back millions of years the man's job was one thing and one thing only to hunt he was single-minded and he was focused on creating food for the family the woman in those times had 15,000 tasks they had to cook they had to clean they had to listen for the sounds of the animals they had to make sure their children were safe most men can focus on one thing and one thing only and women are able to multitask and have a different part of their brain which allows them to not have compartmental syndrome so most yeah. men have a box in their head called the nothing box and in that part of their brain they can think of nothing <laughs> anton does it a lot he's just vacant sometimes. <laughs> he's just sitting there doing nothing whereas <laughs> women have interchangeable boxes and they can do lots and lots of things at once so they and can the see a situation and, and the boxes focused. are connected as well nigel yes of course us men we can go fishing or we can watch tv we can drive or we can be on the phone we can't multitask women have a phenomenal brain activity called interconnection so they can think and do yeah. anton can just watch he can't talk Gordon is able to write notes but can't look up. But do so, you're able to ask questions but you can't look at the messages. And I'm just a monkey and I just want to have fun. So I, I, is it Gordon? Is it, is it that simple? Is it just down I, to pure evolution? Um, possibly, possibly. I, I couldn't. Uh, I, I couldn't say, but I, I do agree with Nigel in that differentiation, and it, and it could be because we were hunters. But I also think as well that um, another important aspect of leadership is compassion, and yeah. I, I think we have to be compassionate about people. And I think, you know, again, it, it's sexist of us to say it, but I think we're being more pro women and anti-men than uh, the alternative and i think i think women do have a propensity to be more compassionate than uh, than than a lot of men do on in general so i think that that compassion that ability to multitask that interconnectivity that and, and as nigel says we we can see it um you know in the in the in the us and there's a there's a great video of um boris johnson who is talking about there are some countries that will not for you know that will let businesses close down and won't let them sell their products and generate and it's almost as if they've a one track of we've got to get the economy right we've got to get the economy right which is you know the import the economy is important but you've got to balance that with the the health and well the well-being of people and that's two different boxes and they are connected, but if you've got the one box syndrome, as Nigel eloquently puts it, if you're in the health box, your economy is going to go to in the tank. If you're in the economy box, then your population is probably going to be in the tank as well. And you've got to get you've got to get that balance right and be compassionate across the board and not just on one thing. Gordon, something you just said that I want to go one stage further. So yeah. in my model of being a champion. The H yeah. stands for heart. And what women do better than most men is they give people a piece of their heart, not a yeah. piece of their mind. And they yeah. give their staff a good listening to, not a good talking to. So yeah. if you want to be a real leader today, this is men or women, you've got to start listening to your people and you've yeah. got to start coming from your heart instead of just your head. Because yeah. social distancing, <coughs> social isolation is literally killing people. Yeah, we're going to find very soon that depression and this idea that people aren't interconnecting with people is going to be a bigger killer possibly than COVID-19. Yeah, agree. <clears throat> there's, a, there's another string of um, another string of questions coming in. I'm <laughs> trying to kind of club all of that together um, on, on common themes as best I possibly can. Um, and but nevertheless, ask the question, a very pointed question from one of the um, audience members. Then why is it that we don't have enough women um, in leadership positions? And 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 the boys, um, a, uh, the boys, <laughs> uh, it's not yeah. job. in about 50 years time. There will be many more women in senior leadership roles 
but what men do without knowing it, it's called unconscious bias, that we look around a room. And unfortunately, if you look at our little forum here, we've got four men here. I'm not saying always you have to have a lady on the panel, but a lot of times there are no ladies on the panel. So that then means the next generation think this is the way the panels need to be. So I'm going, so to, to, I'm going to challenge you on that, Nigel, um, in, in, in a nice way. Uh, you talk about it being an unconscious bias. I, I think that's a little bit true, but I, I've actually seen it as a conscious bias where oh, people said, oh, we don't want a woman. Yeah, we don't want a woman in charge. And the, you know, one of my one of my things on this is that, you know, one of the things we talk about uh, in the Bible is, you know, God created man in his own image. And actually man created God in his own image. And we we tend to promote people that are like us. So if you've got 10 men and they're recruiting people, they're going to recruit somebody who's like them, who's going to fit in. And the person who's going to fit in with them the most is an, is another man. And I, I worked in a company where every single member of the senior leadership team was white, European, and between the ages of uh, 40 and 50. Every go, single go, one We call that MPS, male, pale and stale. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, you, and you, it, a lot of it, for me, uh, I, I am very pro diversity, but I'm even more pro diversity of thinking as well. You want different, you want to bring different thinking to that, and um, and I do think women offer that as well. But even often within the uh, male pale and stale, it's even a narrower group of old white men that are in charge. They all have the same mindset, the same thinking, the same direction, and you don't get that diversity. And I completely agree with Nigel. I think once we come out of this COVID-19 crisis and we start to get elections, people are going to look at who got us through this. And there might be a move towards uh, more women or people might decide, I just want to be, I want a chance to be richer and go back to the uh, male, pale and um, stale model again. And if everyone's Thank thinking you. the same thing, no one's thinking, which is Correct. why you need a different collective. <coughs> yeah. So when I talk about communication and using animals as a model, if you have the whole zoo, as I call it, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes, if you've got a different collection of people, whether it's male or female, you have a great leadership team. At the moment, you have some teams who are just full of one animal. So if you think mm -hmm. about a pride of lions, if you only had lions, you wouldn't have a zoo. If you only had a pride of lions, you'd have no Serengeti. And sometimes that's how it appears. So your communication style and the way you lead people is vital today. So I am trying to produce you. I'm sure you had a great question. You haven't had any so far, but I think there's a great think, question coming. Let me just let me add one more thing to that as well. And and that is that a lot of times people say we need people to fit with our culture. But if you if you take Nigel and myself, we're two uh english white males who could probably do with being fitter and if we decided sorry. that we, sorry uh, <laughs> yes it, you know it's true i don't know where you are on the cycle but you know it's true and if we were to go and decide we wanted to get fitter and if we were to recruit another aging not so fit English person, instead of going down the gym, Nigel would have persuaded him that what we needed to do was go down the pub and watch football, because that would have been the culture that we wanted. And if we want to change, we need to get somebody who's of the culture that we want to be with. Yeah, that's right. Chocolate, chocolate, chocolate. You know, we need some 25 year old hard body who's no interest in the things that we've got to force us to drive the change that we want to do. Whereas if we've got everybody thinking the same, we'll be like, yeah, you know what? I'm not that overweight. The football's on. Let's go watch the football. We won't make the change. So we've Gordon, got to I've, never, I've never thought that, Gordon. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that, on that. You're down the gym all the time. <laughs> no, no. I, I, I want to kind of um, refer to something um, Nigel said. I, I'm still getting quite a lot of con um, um, messages on on this whole gender equation, but I'll try and veer slightly away from that. Um, there was a very poignant question raised, and, and I think um, what you referred to, Nigel, is, is a fantastic entry point to that. The question was whether it is down to gender or it is actually down to diversity. 
um, and that sometimes we have um, gender spoken about in a in a rather biased way in either camp. So whether you're a male or a female, the way you look at things and the way you think Sorry, about can things. I, can, I, can I just interrupt you? That is men saying we don't need women. We can do that thing that they do. Might very Sorry, well be. That's, quiet, that which is door being, that's that door being closed on women. We don't need them. We've got the empathy thing covered. Go back and ask the person who wrote that message. Are you male or female? Are they yeah, and my, <laughs> okay. yeah, my I'm, money's on them I'm, being I'm, uh, male. <laughs> I'm, 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 as I said, I, I, this is why I made my little disclaimer saying I will try, um, I will try my best to kind of steer this conversation because um, I knew this was going to get really controversial. But, but we haven't started aside, yet, trust me. No, I know, I know. I'm, I'm, I'm bracing myself for this. So, um, Nigel, you, you spoke about the zoo, and I think that that's a lovely analogy, um, and, and I know. Your book is on that. Can you give us a quick, because lots of um, the members of the audience who are listening in might not necessarily have read the book um, and it might be alien to them. So can you quick, quickly give us um, a rundown of what you meant by the zoo, the different I'm animals doing, in it? I'll do a one minute appraisal of a book that I've just written called It's a Zoo Around Here. And it's about looking after your people from a leadership point of view and recognizing in your camp, in your workplace, in your family, you have many different animals. So we have got people who are single minded, visionary, purposeful, persevering. They are what I call the lions. We've then got the monkeys who are playful, energetic, extrovert, lively, persuasive. And they are your classic monkeys. Then we've got the elephants who are cautious, precise, deliberate, questioning and formal. And then you have the lovely dolphins, tilt of head, who are caring, nurturing, supportive, patient and relaxed and everyone who's listening to this right now if they were to tell you whether they think they're a lion a monkey an elephant a dolphin you would then find out who's in our camp so we can't see this so we are communicating blind but if they were part of our team gordon and i would want to spend some time listening to them so we could become the official and let's get ready for this we can become an official zookeeper and the zookeeper <coughs> is the person who manages the zoo and if you are clever that's what you do the problem is gordon and i very often we're monkeys and we are yeah. giving you grief in how you're running the session because all the speakers before today allowed you time you asked them questions they gave you sensible answers the problem is the lions they would much rather be right than happy they don't want to know about the answers. It's men who rule the world. That's how it is. <laughs> yeah. But then we've got elephants who are listening to this, and you're going to love this hat. Okay. Can, can I and they're hoping, <laughs> they're hoping, Fiducia and Anton, that Gordon and I have got notes for everyone to listen to, and they're hoping that everyone's going to have a pamphlet. But the monkeys are thinking oh, one thing right now. <laughs> they're thinking where to get the hats from. <laughs> So and then we've got the dolphins, just very quickly. This is our lovely hat, who want to make the world a better place and they want to make everything safe. So the question is for everyone who's listening, and if they go to my website at nigelrisner.com, I have a quiz online. They can <clears> find a quiz, it's free of charge, and they can find out what animal they are. But this is the whole point about leadership. It doesn't matter what animal you are, your job is to be a zookeeper and feed the animals the food they want not the food you have. So I know in the post from Anton, there's an enormous bar of chocolate coming, okay? Because that's one of my requirements. If Gordon was a lion, he would want fresh meat. If Anton was a dolphin, he'd want fresh fish. And Vidusha, we know you're an elephant, so we'll send you vegetation. <laughs> we feed the animals the right food, you have a well-managed zoo. But if you send me tuna fish, I promise you, I'm going to act out. And that's what happens in leadership. You are giving your staff, by not listening to them, the wrong food. So I've read, I've read Nigel's book and I, I, I really enjoyed it. And I, I kind of believe it. And I, I had that. <laughs> he kind of, I love that. Yeah, that's and, and I had, and I had and I had the benefit of uh, attending uh, 
a small group webinar, uh, sorry, not webinar, workshop that Nigel did where he explained this to people. And not only do we have to do this at work, but we also have to do this at home. And it was unbelievable. One of the things that happened, Nigel was talking about communication styles and all of a sudden, one of these guys, this was in Florida, all of a sudden this guy stood up and he went, oh my God, now I understand that every time when I go towards my son with my arms out to give him a hug and he pulls back, it's got nothing to do with me. He, he's an elephant and he doesn't want, that's not how he communicates. And he said, I've been, I've been talking to my son in the wrong language for years and and that guy just listen to Nigel speak and cover that he had an epiphany which allowed him to now go back home and say okay how can I communicate with my son in a way that's going to allow us to make a connection rather than him backing away hands up rejecting me and, and it was such a it was such a powerful moment now but if you think about that and you take that to a team you're leading where you've got 10 people, 50 people, 100 people, and you're pushing 75% of them away because you're communicating in a style that doesn't align with them. Imagine the performance that you're losing from doing that and the uh, how you're weakening your leadership position. So this stuff is massively powerful and I've, I've seen it firsthand. I don't know if you remember that, Nigel. That was a... We were, we were doing a session with Vistage in Florida, I remember. Correct, yeah. yeah. But, it, but let's go one stage further. If you think about most presidential men who pretend they're a lion and you've got a population of the other animals, they're going yeah. to be dictatorial in the way they share information. Whereas yeah. the New Zealand prime minister, who is a young mother, who is yeah. sharing information from the heart, she's in integrity, She's saying we need to do this for the sake of the country. Yeah. She's not worried about her popularity. And can you imagine a country like New Zealand, which has 15% of its income based on tourism and saying we are going to close our borders. We might do a bit of trade with Australia. We might, but we are closing our borders. That's a leader who is looking after its people. And that's called a leader with <coughs> dolphin tendencies, but with a massive zookeeper hat on. And, and uh, okay. one, other, one other aspect of that as well is, and I'm defending leaders a little bit here, if you, if you now turn that around the other way, and if you look at what's happening in the US where Trump's a, a, a lion, you can't... L-I-A-R or L-I-O-N? <laughs> Both. What you, can, what you cannot do is you cannot approach him with reams and reams of documentation, graphs, mm -hmm charts data because he's not going to listen he's or not it, going to get it. it yeah he's not going to read it he's not going to look at it so you have to find a way to communicate to the leader in a way that they go oh yeah i've got this now and we can we can move forward because the communication it's it's two ways both down and uh, up as well and i think you know that's that's one of the challenges that we see with some of the lion leaders not only do they give out uh, signals that are probably not the right signals, the information they're taking in um, and acting on isn't necessarily the right information or it's just not getting through to them. No, fantastic. And, 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 and thank you for members, Medusha, actually telling us which animals they are. Well, I, I will I will take a, a look at the feed um, and, and keep you posted because there there were a couple of them that said thank you for that and um, that they will check up on it. So if those I get any the feedback, those I are the dolphins. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the lions already know who they are. The monkeys are never going to be able to find my website. The elephant have already checked this out already. So and that literally uh, a thing. Um, thank you for that because I'm again I'm I'm just reading the feed as you as you speak and. And, and you're right, I am finding it difficult, but um, thank you for actually bringing that up because it was a conversation that um, that we've had on gender. Thank you for bringing it in um, and thank you for opening it up. Um, once again, we are not here to make dictatorial statements about anything, but thank you for sharing your point of view because I think it is a point of view that needs to be shared. I, I'm a lion and I am here to make dictatorial statements. <laughs> <laughs> 
I have no idea what he just said, but I think it's brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> With the five minutes span. I want to I wanna, I wanna just move on that particular piece and augment it a little bit. Because if that is the case, and if we all look at things differently, and I'm sure we do, um, and, and, and this goes down to core, core personality as well, but it's tremendously difficult for organizations to do this because they have large populations of people, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, sometimes 10, 15,000 in, in different geographies. Um, there's a lovely question that says, how do we do that in practice? When How can we segregate people based on their innate preferences for information, innate preferences for inspiration, and feed them what they want when all we have sometimes is just an email or or, or, or a conversation like this? The do so, how do you I'm make life very simple, okay? And I'll challenge you and Gordon with a very simple question. That if I said to you that the only reason why people come to work is for one reason, one reason only, what would you say? I guess to get work done. Okay, so that's what you think. And here's the problem in real leadership today. There's only one reason why people come to work. And if you're a great champion, you're a great leader, you know the answer. And the answer is to get their personal needs met. Yeah. And if you know what their personal needs are, and you give your staff a good listening to, you have the first part of the puzzle. Then you want to make sure you know their Please. personality traits by listening to them. And then Gordon will say, you need to have a fast approach from a brilliant book that he wrote that says you need to be focused on the right people. If you don't know your people and you don't know why they come to work, you can't motivate them. And when we come out of COVID-19, there's not going to be loads more money what there will be, though, is the great leaders being able to give people some of their personal needs. So I jokingly said, I need chocolate. OK, so if you give me chocolate, I'm happy. If you give Gordon time off to travel with his wonderful wife, is happy. If you let Anton play golf and go to, not play golf, if you let him go and pick up his kids from nursery, he's happy. But do shit, if we send you more books for you to read to put on your wonderful library, you're happy. Most of them don't cost much money. But if yeah. I give all four of us the same thing, you then lose out in leadership. So the question is, do you know your people? And you can't know them all. So I have a team of people and I only need to know two people. Those two people need to know their seven people. Those seven people need to know their 20 people. So if you're a great leader, you work with an executive team, you must find out their personal needs. One of my personal needs is chocolate. One of my personal needs is Diet Coke. One of my personal needs, when I go to an airport, there's someone to meet me with my name on a board. When One of my personal needs is we do a setup like we did yesterday and we had lots of fun. If you had have sent Gordon and I 50 questions to answer, you wouldn't have sorted our personal needs out. But there have been people over the last 11 days who would only have spoken to you if you gave them the questions in advance. So it's about have, you adapting your style to us. And they would have been disappointed if you only asked 49 of those 50 questions. Exactly <laughs> right. <laughs> so, no, so there's, a, there's, a, there's a really good book um, written by uh, an Indian gentleman called uh, Samir Dua, and he, Samir, Samir Dua, and he talks about, it's not about taking care of your people, it's taking care of what they care about. And Good if you luck. take care, if you take if you take care of what they care about, that is what's going to generate loyalty. So find out what they care about and take Repeat care of that it. line, Gordon. Repeat that take, line. I like that one. Take care of what they care about. Yeah, yeah. Because That's if, about their personal needs, Gordon. Correct. Absolutely. So if, if they, you know, if they, if if their priority is to be able to pick up their kids from school, work around that. If you if you take care of that, you'll you'll build loyalty into them. Because and because it also shows you care. So what we've found, Gordon, and you know, is that we've got more and more people working from home, and they've been trusted to do it, and they're producing phenomenal results. We right. are twenty years ahead of the game now because yeah. of COVID nineteen. For years, <clears throat> Gordon and I have spoken about trust, that if you yeah. trust your people, you don't need fixed hours. The problem yeah. is we didn't trust our people. 
Now people are in their homes and in the UK, in America, in Belgium, all over Europe, people have been forced to work from home. So now we have to trust them that they can work from home. So I think it's a little bit more. Uh, there's another side to that as well, Nigel. I, I've just worked on the my first ever project. I just led a team of 50 people where I never met a single person. I, it was 100% virtual. And, and I agree that we have to trust our people. But I think there is an element that some leaders don't trust in their own ability to yep. be able to lead people that they can't see. So I don't trust me and I don't trust you. That is a, a, a huge obstacle to and trust. And trust. And trust, by the way, Gordon, is like yep. pregnancy. You either are or you're not. And you either do <laughs> trust or you don't. There's no middle yeah. ground. No one's ever been a little bit pregnant. And no. that's the problem. So <laughs> Susan and Anton, when you asked Gordon and I to do this seminar, we just yeah. said yes, because we trusted you. We yeah. don't have to like you, by the way. And neither of us like you, Anton. But do so we love. <laughs> we don't necessarily like you. But this is the point. But we trust you to deliver a phenomenal nuggets of information because we yeah. know your type of work if we like you that's a bonus but in the workplace you have a lot of issues where we like each other we go to the pub but we don't trust each other yeah. so gordon and i have worked together he's recommended me to some of his clients because he's trusted me mm -hmm. the like bit comes later the problem yeah. is we often interview based on whether we like them but we don't trust them yeah and the other thing about Hold on to that thought, Gordon. I have, a, I have a beautiful question here, and I think it's, it's, it's worth exploring because they're asking, um, what comes first? Do you trust somebody to, to, to deliver on something, or do you wait for somebody to deliver it and then trust them afterwards? Because this is professional trust, not so, personal trust. So, that's, um, just so that's just the point I was going to make. Trust is reciprocal. If I trust somebody, uh, that trust will come back to me. So if I want people to trust me, I have to trust them. If I don't trust them, why should they trust me? And we also have that situation of self-fulfilling prophecies. And if I don't, if I didn't, if I don't trust Nigel to do a job, why should I give him that work? I've just set him up for failure. Leadership, as I said at the start, is about putting people in a position where they can be successful. And one of the things to do that is to trust that they will be successful by trusting that I've given them everything that they, they need to do. And I think people that wait until trust is proven uh, are going to probably be waiting for a long time for themselves to be trusted. And what Producer, happens? There's a, there's a, Producer, just, I, had, I had a brain aneurysm three years ago. So I'm now laying literally on a gurney waiting for someone to do brain surgery. I had to trust the brain surgeon. Now, I wouldn't necessarily <laughs> let Gordon do brain surgery on me. <laughs> I'm not sure he knows enough about that so yeah. I to give him my credit card. And this is the key difference, that if you interview and they've got the qualifications and your gut, and by the way, your gut is your second brain. So you have a, you have a nerve that goes from the side of your brain down to your gut, it's called the vagus nerve. And if you trust your gut when you meet someone and they've got the right qualifications and they appear nice, because I think you should only appoint nice people and then train them well, you will find that in time, your trust gets reciprocated. I work yeah. with people I trust and my gut tells me. I get it wrong once or twice a year, <clears throat> but 98% yeah. of the time, my gut diary and I write a gut diary every day. So at six o'clock this morning, I wrote down in my notes, this is going to be a fun interview and I have no idea what's going to happen, but let's have some fun. Yeah. And so far, Gordon and I would say, that's right. We've not yeah. met you in Colombo. We were supposed to come to Sri Lanka in the middle of the year. We'll hopefully be in Sri Lanka in January or February as soon as we can fly to you. So we're just Absolutely. trusting you. We don't know where this material is going. We don't know how much money we're going to get paid. We don't know how much chocolate's going to get sent to us. We just <clears> trust <throat> you. Does that make sense? So leadership is about trust until you get let down. Yeah. Now, and it, there's, there's a slight difference. I wouldn't want someone doing brain surgery me if they didn't know what brain surgery was. So there's a difference between proficiency and trust in people. Yeah. Th thank you for the difference. There was a lovely lead-on question to that, um, um, which is, 
what do you do when that trust is broken? Because um, um, you are responsible for the organization and you are taking a, a position of leadership um, um, where you have to eventually take a call. But when you trust like that, and if people do break that trust, where do you go from there? Three, wo three words, inspire or fire. <laughs> so if, cool. let's just say I messed up today, <laughs> but my intention was to do it right. The question I ask my leaders are, are you willing to invest $10,000 in that person to make them better? And if you're not, you need to send them in an Uber to your biggest competitor and let them be a terrorist over there. Yeah. There are two lots of people that work in organizations. There are loving, nurturing, caring people who mean well. And then there are what I call psychic vampires that literally suck energy from an organization. And those people are normally the ones you don't trust. So you can only do two things. You can either inspire them to greatness or you fire them. The problem in leadership is we often don't fire them quick enough and then they are infiltrating another group of people to become bigger terrorists. It's a very Gordon. strong word I've just said. And Gordon yeah. will back me up on this because he has fired millions of people. He is known as the hatchet <laughs> man of the Industrial Revolution. <laughs> I, I've actually, throughout my entire career, I've actually fired three people. Only, <laughs> only, only three. Now, a lot of people, after having spoken to me have said you know what i don't think i fit in here i need to move on and and i, I think what we need to do is when you say uh, they broke our trust it's a question of what does that mean if it's they failed and i trusted them to succeed why did they fail if yeah. it was they, if they didn't have the right tools that's my fault if the, if the instructions weren't clear that's my fault if they hadn't got the right training Again, that's potentially uh, my fault. If they didn't have the time and the resources, again, that's my fault. But if they chose not to succeed and they willfully lost my trust, then as Nigel says, that's the time where you need to look at that and say, well, you know, now it's time for the exit and the door. But in my experience, the majority of people don't fail because they just couldn't be bothered. They fail for one of the other reasons. So if we fix that, we're probably going to fix them as an employee. And if we if we can't fix that, then we need to look at it and say, you know what, this is this is a bad fit and uh, move them out. Dead right. Thank you. For, no, thank you for drawing that distinction. I think the distinction is very very important to understand why people failed. Yeah. Um, and and the word that you used. Um, just just so to, to reiterate it um willfully um yeah. uh, you know not wanting Vidusha, to succeed because you to be work. Vidusha, nobody comes to work to do a bad job they don't wake up in the morning and go today's the day i want to destroy the company and yeah. if they do that that's the people you need to leave but yeah, sure. really, Gordon and i want to do the best recording we can to give you the best yeah. information it doesn't mean we might mess up occasionally but we want to give you the best knowledge and information we've got. And we might mess up once or twice. And the, the accidental swear word might come out, whatever it is. The question is, we need to make sure we're in integrity. Yeah. No, I completely agree. Classic what just happened there with Gordon. Okay. Uh, yeah. His wonderful the... wife, Kareen, has come in, wants to offer him tea, coffee, find out why he's speaking so loudly. <clears throat> didn't deliberately want to set this up and Gordon didn't deliberately want to ruin the production that's just what <laughs> in the no. of life. and no, I know no. her very well and if she okay. makes coffee I'll have one too but we, seriously that's what happens in life there are mistakes that are made but it wasn't willfully done to destroy the operation and it was there my mistake I didn't have the power and she was following my instructions <laughs> 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 and that's what I'm doing the next interview on my own, okay? No. So the, so the, and, the and other thing about what you said, Nigel, is that people don't come to work to uh, to, to fail. And yeah, you know, I, I often get challenged by that when people say, are you sure? Yeah, because there is nothing more soul-destroying than going to work five days a week and, and not succeeding everybody wants to be successful so as leaders if we can put them in a position to be successful my experience is people will take it yes sometimes 
people will get bowled up an easy ball and they might not hit it out of the ground and get caught. But the majority of people will step up and give it a massive smack with the bat. And that's what we've got to do. Put people in a position where they'd be successful and the majority, 99.9% .9 of the people, will take it. And we have to trust them to, to do that. No, that's a that's a beautiful point of view, right? And and that puts a lot of focus and emphasis and ownership on people who are giving instructions rather than the people who are following the instructions. Now yeah. that brings us to another lovely question on 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 the feed, and this is something that I'm very very passionate about, um, which is, I think following is also a skill. Um, and I don't think we we, we talk about it enough. Um, as much as leading is important, I think following is not not just a passive activity. Um, following is something this which is the flip side of uh, leadership. But at the same time, we all need to follow and lead both at the same time sometimes. And we misunderstand leadership as a position of power, isn't it? Um, and and sometimes as a title. But if you're it's a free leader, leader I know what is following you. You're lonely, okay? So the yeah. question I always ask people is, how good are your followership skills more than your leadership skills? So sure. if you want to be a phenomenal, phenomenal leader, the question is, are you in a position that people will want to follow you? There are oh. many, and we go back to the New Zealand, the New Zealand Prime Minister. People are desperate to follow her instruction. People are desperate to go with what she's saying because she shows those traits. There are other people we know, and I'm not going to mention any names, where they're leading and millions are not going to follow that way. So the question you need to ask yourself is, what are my followership skills like more than my leadership skills? And then do we have a great partnership? So leadership yeah. without followership is nothing. And if you're in partnership with your followers, you have a family. So for me, leadership is is the differentiate between success and failure but the ability to get people to follow you is, is crucial and one of the traits that you need to have in order to get people to follow you is to follow your own advice and we've seen in the us trump come out and say everybody should wear a mask but you know what it's only advice i'm not going to do it how many people do you think are now going to wear masks is it a hundred percent is it 50 percent? It's certainly not going to be everybody. And then when you get people like you know, Mike Pence touring factories where everybody's wearing a mask and the leader is not following their own guidelines, you're actually telling people this is what we'd like to do. But you know what? It's optional and I'm not going to do it. Leaders, we've got to we've got to. Uh, talk the talk and then we've got to walk the talk we've got to follow our own direction so that then the majority of people will follow up followers as well now there'll be some that will deviate but if you don't even follow your own direction you just multiply that number by i don't know factor 10 factor a, a hundred so we've got a bit of follow uh, ourselves as well um, thank you, Gordon. And, and I'm conscious of the time. It is 11.55, but I did ask permission. I knew this might actually spin off a little bit. Um, so for those of you who are watching in, we have a few extra minutes. Um, Gordon and Nigel both have uh, graciously accepted to extend time um, and be with us uh, a, a bit more just because it's it's in, important enough to explore this um, and, and bring it to a finality. So just following up on that, on the on the flip side, if people don't follow, and if people don't necessarily do what is required, especially in times of crisis, when when a lot is at stake, mm -hmm. um, then then what are leaders supposed to do? You said inspire or fire, um, which is which is fine. Um, so I but so I so let me just come back on that um, and then hand it straight over to Nigel. If people aren't following you, the, the number one question to ask is: Are you meeting their needs? Okay. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Nigel. So the key for me is and one of the letters of my champion model is integrity. <clears throat> if you're high on integrity and what you say is what you do and what you do is what you say and people follow you what, how you are as a leader, they will want to go that path. The problem is a lot of leaders do not have high integrity. So Gordon and I did some research. We made sure we were online at 615. You know, for me, it was 6.15 in the morning. For Gordon, it was 7.15. For you people, you had an extra four hours of sleep. 
But for yeah. us poor people in England, <laughs> we, but that was called being an integrity to offer you a great service. If you are a champion, if you're a leader, look at your people. What do they need? Listen to your people. What are they saying? Where do they want to go? And are they feeling safe? The bottom line is people can deal with change. They cannot cope with uncertainty. So we've had millions of years of change and we can deal with change. What we have, we have a major issue with is uncertainty. So if animals aren't being fed the right food, if people aren't being led the right way, we struggle, we panic. So please, if you're listening to this, recognize that change occurs daily, weekly, monthly, yearly. But it's the uncertainty if you're a leader, you have got to lead your people through. And and and, and that, that brings again a brilliant kind of um, area of focus. Um, Again, I'm inundated questions. I'm I'm trying my best to kind of club it, but around the whole innovation piece, uh, more more than ever before, I think we are demanded to be innovative. We are we are demanded to relook at things and our assumptions, uh, and leadership plays a huge role in this. And and in our part of the world, we always say that it that that change and that 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 space should be led from the top. Um, is that true universally? Um, should change be led from the top? Innovation be as a culture be be brought about from the top? Uh, so I, I think I think it depends what you mean. Um, I, I've worked in a companies where they believe that innovation comes from the top, which means the boss has to think up all the new ideas. Uh, and when you <laughs> and when you and when you create no, honestly, I've seen that where you know we, we have management who, are, who believe they're the only people that can innovate. And and actually what that does is that stifles innovation lower down. And what leaders need to do is they need to create an environment in which innovation can thrive. They need to create a culture in which innovation can thrive. And I think a lot of uh, a lot of what we're seeing now is quite interesting because a lot of times people will say, oh, we want to do this and say, oh, it's not possible. And yet now in the where well, we've got coronavirus, what we're seeing is a lot of things that people said weren't possible. Oh, we can't have you working from home. And yet now everybody's working from home. And if you'd have said to me four <clears throat> weeks ago, I would be speaking to nearly a thousand people in Sri Lanka on a computer. Gordon knows that my whole operation is one iPhone and a memory stick. That's all <laughs> I have. And I, I travel the world with one phone and a memory stick. The idea of doing Zoom or Microsoft Team to a thousand people with a panel, with camera, yeah. logging on. I can tell you now, a month ago, this monkey would have said, I can't do it. Correct. What I really meant was, I won't do it. Yes. And now I've been forced to do it. I'm now loving this. I've never been to so many countries in the last week and a half <laughs> without having jet lag. I mean, seriously. <laughs> <laughs> What's possible is so different today. It doesn't mean, by the way, that I don't want a standing ocean, a standing ovation from Vedusha and Anton and Gordon when I finish. <laughs> I want chocolate thrown down the screen because I miss hugs. I miss yeah. being looked after and acknowledged because that's what motivational. Most motivational yeah. speakers, we don't get it from our wives. We get it from an audience. <laughs> you know, so what we look to, we're missing that. So. You've got to think that people want acknowledgement, recognition. Yeah. But what we've got to find is things can be done differently. So I'm waiting. I keep looking out my window for the chocolate to arrive. I keep hoping a truck is going to deliver the chocolate that you promised. <laughs> and if I don't hear beeps, the truck can't be big enough. OK, so <laughs> thank you for letting Gordon and I share our insights and our wisdom. We will be delighted to support anybody who asks questions. Yeah. And our books are available. Our website, I'm sure you'll give out. But we're here to support Sri Lanka and your economy. Yeah, sure, absolutely. And, and thank you for that. That, that, that. It's a lovely inroad to 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 something that that is very dear to my heart because all of us professionally, what we do is, is to. Um, I hate to use the word training because I think leadership can't be trained; it should be learned. It's something I always say. Um, but we are here to guide people um, on their leadership journey, and for each one of them, it's a very very special journey. Um, I'm trying to question. Um, I'm trying to coin a question which is very, very close to me, but at the same time, some of the questions that has come in as well. So there's two parts to this. The first is um, from a couple of young people who have written in to say, what should young people do in order to make sure that they become leaders of the future? But let me try and put that to perspective from the both of you um, being coaches for for leadership. 
Um, you can't really, you can't really train someone or coach someone who's not ready as well. And, and it's a fine line. Um, so how do you know people are ready for the leadership journey? And so, what can people do um, in order to get on with that journey? Sorry, Gordon, go ahead. So, so I'll, I know that uh, Sri Lanka is a fantastic cricketing nation. Uh, and I appreciate the fact that what you do is you don't train anybody in cricket until they're selected for the Sri Lankan cricket team because now they're they're ready to play at test level. That's not the way you do it, is it? You you no. train people from the as soon as they can pick up a bat, you train them how to hit the ball. As soon as they can throw the ball, you teach them how to bowl. So in order to become a leader, go out and lead. Practice the skills. If you wait, I used to tell these people in my organization all the time, if you wait until I offer you a leadership position before you start to show and practice leadership capability, you will never, ever lead for me. I have to see you leading. So go out there, practice the skills, read the books, try it, go and lead a football team, go and lead a cricket team, go and lead in your community, in your church, in your temple, wherever. Get as much leadership practice and experience as you can. So it is a very perfect thing. Can, can I tell leader. you the yes, four things you need to do to be a great leader? Are you ready? Yep, go for it. You need to drink steal, swear and lie. They are the four attributes everyone in Sri Lanka needs to learn, OK? Now, you, at this point, you think I'm a little bit crazy, don't you? So what you need to do to be a great leader is you need to drink from the fountains of knowledge that are constantly flowing in from our books and libraries. All great leaders are readers. Yeah. You need to steal a little time each and every day to do something for someone else, even when you know you won't get the credits. You need to swear to make this the best day of your life because you never know it's going to be your last. This is not a dress rehearsal for the rest of your life. This is it. And when you lie down in bed tonight, thank your God that you've got dreams and you can make them possible. And that's what real leadership is about. Absolutely. Uh, thank you for that. And and, and there's a follow up question. So I'm getting questions and I'm trying to <laughs> kind of keep a straight face because, you know, um uh, and not look down all the time but my apologies um there's a follow-up question on that so how would organizations create that environment for people to do that because the moment a young person comes in nine times out of ten you're the rookie um and 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 um you're scared to make mistakes and um here i'm told to lead um, um and there's and there's the very problem, what you just said here they're scared to make a mistake if you're not making mistakes you're not growing if you're not making mistakes you're not learning if, you, if everything you're doing is perfect you're not stretching enough. The idea that Gordon and I are on this call, he's in Belgium, I'm in the UK, you're in Sri Lanka, and yesterday afternoon when we did our practice, it was not seamless for the first three minutes. Is that fair? No, correct. That yeah. basis, we would not be doing this seminar today because we'd have been fired. You've yeah. got <laughs> to allow people, if they're nice, no, seriously, Obviously, Gordon and I, well, Gordon's much nicer than I am. But if you're nice <laughs> to start with, there is a chance you can teach. If yeah. they're not nice and you're a bully and you're a psychic vampire, <laughs> you're an internal terrorist, they shouldn't be employed anyway. Everybody yeah. that you employ, if they're nice and are trusted, should make some mistakes. There's a company I work with in America that the more you fail, the more you get paid. And you have to get permission to say no, because their game is you've got to find ways to say yes. It means that there'll be some mistakes. I reward anyone who makes a mistake and tells me so that we never make that mistake again. But if somebody makes the same mistake twice, they are what we call stupid. Yeah. <laughs> and three three strikes and you're out. I, I, would, I would just go right back to what you said there, and that is that... Um, People in organizations who are not given an environment in which to lead. If if you're waiting for the organization to create an opportunity for you to lead, you are a follower. I can tell you that this is probably truer than I'd like it to be. In every single organization I've ever worked for, if they could have had somebody else leading it other than me, they would have probably jumped at the chance. 
But what I did was I went and I studied on my own. I read books. I took courses. I took classes. I led whether I was asked to or not. And then when we had times of crisis, when we needed people who could take decisive action, I was ready and willing to do it and step forward. And that's how I became a leader. I didn't become a leader because an organization thought, oh, he's got nice qualifications. He was somebody that we could look to develop. I developed myself. Leadership is a choice. And it's a question of whether you let your organization make that choice or whether you make that choice. And I would recommend to everybody, make the choice to be a leader and do the drink, steal, swear and lie that Nigel mentioned. Well, that's that's awesome, Liput. I think I think that's going to get picked up really, really fast and um, and, and probably typed out and um, passed around as well. So thank you for that. That that was awesome. Um, ju just to dive a little bit into it from an organizational perspective, because there are a lot of managers who are listening in today. What can be done to actually be supportive coaches of people? Uh, what should we do to make sure that we create that environment for people? So, that so was I think- That's a good question for me as a monkey. So let the last <laughs> answer first, and I'll think so, about it afterwards. So I, so I think what we need to do is we need, to, we, we need to be a little bit of a dolphin on this, and we need to focus on nurturing people, and we need to give them opportunities um in in order to lead you know delegate some of our power away so that we give people the chance to go and do something and try and match the chance to their capability so it's a little bit of a stretch rather than oh just you know go and lead us through the covid19 crisis even though you've never had any leadership expression experience that's probably a little bit too much but give them little baby steps nurture them give them the opportunity and then support them to either be successful or one of nigel's famous phrases give them the feed forward so that the next time they know what they need to do in order to get it right and that's what we need to do that's what coaching is it's giving people opportunity and then supporting them to be successful in that opportunity See, I'm Gordon. I'm so pleased you use those words. You cannot, people cannot cope with feedback in these times. No. The minute you hear the word feedback, the, the first thing that comes up is that's what my mother said. That's what my wife said yeah. to me. The first thing that comes up is what have I done wrong? Yeah. If you want to grow people, you give them feed forward so they know in the future where they're going. You said something at the very beginning, Kadusha, which was we need to go back to basics. You actually need to go forward to basics. Forward the to basics. Old stuff is the best. Turn up on time. Be smart. Listen. Learn. Ask questions. Be nice. Ask questions. Be nice. Turn up. Be nice. If we develop leaders that way and they had an opportunity for feed forward, so at the end of this interview, I'm sure Kadusha and Anton are definitely definitely Tatum, are going to give me some feed forward at what we could have done to have made this seminar even better. And I'm well, next one better. Because, because it definitely will be better next time. And we'll be back on this in a month's time if the readers and the listeners want. But if you said to me, before you go, I've got a bit of feedback for you. After me waking up at six o'clock in the morning and doing an hour and giving our best stuff, the first thing I'm going to hear is they don't like me. They don't want me. They don't love me. My mother was right. I'll never find someone. All that stuff is what comes out. That's not leadership. Leadership is saying to me, we love you and we want you to do even better. We love you and we want to promote you. We love you and we want you to come to Sri Lanka as soon as you can. We love you and the chocolate's on its way. Those type of things is what we want to hear. What we don't want to hear is, you know what you could have done? In my book, we call that coaching versus commentating. Yeah. Great leaders need to coach their people to success, not be a commentator in their heads. Commentators just tell you what was, and great coaches tell you what can be. They can't affect yeah. the game. If you are, are you a cricket fan, Vidusha? Not very much a rugby fan. Oh, more than okay, a rugby fan. okay, let's I use rugby, know. even though that's alien to Sri Lanka, but let's go with it. Okay, <laughs> just, a bit of, just a bit of feedback for you there. Okay. <laughs> In rugby, the coach's role is to look at the players and how do they get better for the next game. Yeah. 
commentators just tell you what's just happened. It's semantics. But if you listen to a commentator, they'll tell you what's just happened. That doesn't affect the play. It just tells you where you were. Leadership and for people in Sri Lanka, how do we go forward? How do we make the best of it? How do we get tourism back? How do we know that in 2021, life will come back to a bit more normality and the happy smiles on the Sri Lankan people will return? At the moment, we're in commentator mode. Oh, my God, how bad is this? When's it all going to change? So please, if you're listening to this, be a coach, not a commentator. Be in the room. Give people a piece of your heart. Yeah. So just just expanding on that, um, something that I'm going to tell everybody something now that they forget, but we all know in, instinctively, and that is that you don't need to be a commentator because every single one of us as our own commentator inside our heads who's already told us we did it wrong we could have done better we made a mistake we have that role covered personally what we don't need is that role reinforcing uh, and, and making us probably even worse and more hesitant the next time and then the second thing I, I would just reiterate on what Nigel said is and this is probably doing us both a disservice but um, Nigel talked about what it takes to be a good leader, uh, being compassionate, caring, turning up on time, being supportive, being helpful. This is probably going to come as a huge shock. You do not need a PhD in leadership to turn up on time. You don't need a master's in leadership to be nice. You don't need a degree in leadership to be supportive and helpful. These That's are right. things that you're everybody. I'm glad you're saying it and not me. Sorry. <laughs> I'm so glad yeah. you're saying it and not me. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, there's, the you... there's the problem. That Gordon and I completely said. agree. Yeah, but I, I left completely... school at 16. I left school at 16 and was given opportunities by a great leader. Mm. I then played tennis for two years, came back to the UK, was given an opportunity by a 65 year old who let me set up a finance company with him because he saw potential in me and whenever I get the chance to see potential in younger people I give them everything so they can expand I've given licenses to someone in South Africa in Lithuania hopefully we'll have someone in Sri Lanka who will become what I call an official licensed zookeeper and I give them permission to play and I know they will make some mistakes but unless you give permission and you let people play and you give them those skills, a PhD, I mean, I joke with people to say that I have an MBA, OK, except mine stands for a massive bank account because that's the only MBA you should have. <laughs> because the best thing you can do for the poor is not be one of them. Uh, yeah, I make bored and laugh. He liked that one. Yeah, no, I, I worked for I worked for I worked for D H Challenge, our global CIO. He managed two billion, and he, he had a conference with six hundred of his staff. And he asked, "Hands up, all those who've got a degree." And every single hand went up. And he said, "Does anybody notice about who's got their hands up?" And everybody said, "It's everybody." And he said, "It's everybody but me, and I'm in charge." So if you think your paper means anything to me, you are wrong. I couldn't give a about yeah, uh, yeah, paper I, can, yeah. paper, <laughs> I couldn't give a monkeys about yeah, paperwork and degrees. Are there any other um, questions, Dusha? Uh, no, no, no. <laughs> Actually, um, I, I'm, I'm conscious of time, and I really don't want to kind of push my luck here. But, 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 you are. bear with. For I know, I know. So since I'm on that route anyway. <laughs> um, and since you're a monkey and you have an attention span of only about 30 seconds, I'm, I'm going to push my luck and see what happens. But just two more questions. One, which is a follow up on that to say um, we we trust qualifications and things like that to, to look at aptitude. Um, and, and most of us rely on that um, at our interviews. Um, and, and the question just came in when you were speaking about it. But if that is not what it is, how would you actually look at potential? just having a chat with a person okay, How so, would you you, so you know the phrase that we hire for aptitude we always fire for attitude so what what qualifications give you is a benchmark about do they have some basic skills the problem is 
if you, when you interview them, you only interview the people who've been to Oxford, Cambridge, they've got a master's, they've got a PhD, you've now taken away 50% of a possibility of people who've got great potential. There's a phrase from a friend called Ramus Anderson who talks about performance versus potential. Yeah. Do you know about the runner Usain Bolt? Yes. His performance not was not that great when he was first trained by Trevor Francis. His potential was enormous. If his coach had not seen his potential, he would not be the world champion he is. So are you hiring for potential or performance? So don't get me wrong. Obviously, it would be great if they had some qualifications because that shows that some people have an ability to study. But I left school at 15, just before my 16th birthday, so I was involved in a major car crash. If I, if only I got work because of my qualifications, I'd still be unemployed. But people saw potential in me. I've now written five books. I left, I was labeled educationally retarded when I was 13 at school. I went back to my school and I saw Mrs. Pohl in the front row of my school lecture. And I just showed her a copy of my book and said, Mrs. Pohl, you were wrong. That was the title of my speech, because you can't judge people just based on paper. You've no. got to allow them the idea of meeting them. However, if there's 26,000 interviews going on, there's got to be some sort of benchmark, which yeah. is why yeah. you need a good process and psychometric testing to allow people to see what's going on. So as Nigel said earlier, when he had his, uh, when he needs to have brain surgery, he, he didn't just look for attitude, he looked for somebody who was a qualified brain surgeon. But once you've got that entry ticket, then it's about of the people that are qualified, who has the best attitude. And attitude is what determines altitude. And if we've got the right attitude and we've got the right skill set, we can achieve absolutely amazing things. If you've got the right aptitude and the wrong ap attitude, not only will you not achieve your full potential, you'll probably have a negative impact on those around you. What Nigel calls is uh, psychic vampires, massively skilled, but a drain on the organization. So we've got to make sure they've got the right entry criteria to get into the interview. And then we take the people with the best attitude out of the interview as the people we want to hire. No, thank you very much. Um, and I'm so, 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 so glad um, you guys are saying this because um, it is a it is a hot topic of conversation in our very circles as we speak, um, when we consult, when we train. This question always keeps coming up. So thank you for answering that. I'm conscious of time, so I'm going to just well, put it, one last reason, question. The reason and why it keeps that, the, the, one of the problems that really pees me off is that this is a, con a question that keeps coming up. So could I just ask people, s instead of repeatedly asking this question, listen to the bloody answer and act on it. Ooh, ooh. thank you. <laughs> Gordon's <laughs> getting aggressive. The lion is well, coming. He did say he was a lion, right? He did say he's a lion. This is a question that keeps getting asked. It's because the answer never gets listened to. That's yeah, why yeah. people they keep asking the question, hoping the answer is going to be no, no, you're absolutely right. Go with the person who's most qualified. Sorry, that's not the right answer. It wasn't the right answer. It will never be the right answer. Stop asking that bloody question. <laughs> <laughs> right. In the interest of time, um, respectfully, um, I'm going to ask <laughs> my one last question. question. <laughs> and and <laughs> yes, <laughs> one last question because it was something I wanted to ask, and I'm glad that somebody in the audience asked this as well, so I can actually ask that question on their behalf and ask a question I also wanted to. What was that defining moment um, kind of for you? Um, one story that to you is truly inspirational that really, really defined the essence of leadership mm. for you, that, that little moment of, of truth, so to say. Uh, a, 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 a personal story or something that you've observed, one story on, on, <clears throat> on an inspiring leadership moment. Okay, I'll, I'll go first because I always believe we should finish with uh, Nigel. Um, so when I, when, I was ten, when I was 10 years old, I played rugby and I played for a team who we won 50% of our games. We weren't good. We weren't bad. We were 
absolutely average. But in the Cup, we managed to only play against the teams who were worse than us. And we got through to the final. And when we got through to the final, we played the team that was top of the league and who had beaten us, I think, 35-0 at their place and 15-0 at our place. So we had zero chance of winning. And we were a bit dejected when we found out who we were playing. And our coach said, no, 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 don't be dejected. We should be ecstatic because we are an unbeaten cup side. We are absolutely as good as them. The, the challenge that they've got is that they don't know it. They're going to expect that average league team to turn up, whereas we are an unbeaten cup team and we are going to come out there and we are going to surprise them. And that, su that surprise is going to be enough for us to beat them. And being 10 years old, we actually believed that and he gave us individual instructions and we actually went out and we won that game 6-3. Uh, we beat a team we should never have beaten based on capability, but it all happened because the coach gave us the belief. He trusted in us, he trusted in us our skills and he gave us a plan that when we followed it, we were successful. And for me, that showed that leadership can actually transform an average team into a high performing team. And that was the that was kind of like the watershed moment for me that saw the value of uh, of leadership. Thank you, Paul. Nigel. <laughs> 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 that was a long answer. God damn it. It was a story. <laughs> Go ahead, Nigel. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so literally at the same age, about 10 or 11, I was at a summer camp and we had a tuck shop and I was asked to be in charge of this tuck shop based on one thing and one thing only, my What's ability to... to very, very quickly, Nigel, before, before, before you go any further, a tuck shop for those of you who are listening in from our part of the world is like a canteen. Yes, go ahead. except it was for at a, at a summer camp and we sold like chocolates, fizzy drinks, crisps, etc. And... I asked the guy, why did you let me in charge of the tuck shop, the canteen? And he went, because I knew you could upsell. Now, I didn't know what upselling was for like 30 years, but someone saw the potential in me at the age of 10. At 13, I then worked in a ladies market selling dresses where they used to be like a petticoat under a denim skirt. And the same reason I was given was I was selling dresses to women who were 30, 40, 50. I was 13 and a half. I had a tape measure around me and I would say to everyone, I think you're a size eight, but you may want to have an extra top just in case. And I, and I knew how to upsell because someone told me I was good at it and then I believed them. So if you are told at a young age you are good at something and you buy into what they're saying, that's the first step to leadership. So look after your children. And just for the record, if you have two children, your first child is normally a lion stroke elephant because they were spoilt and they had po photos taken of them and we videoed them a lot. The second child are normally dolphins and monkeys because when they fall over, nobody picks them up. There are no videos of them. They always think they're adopted. <laughs> so don't worry about your children. Love them, <laughs> support them and recognise leadership is exactly the same. And Absolutely. thank you for having Gordon and I on on this wonderful webinar uh, thank you very very much nigel and gordon um I, I wish as always that there is more time and i don't have it uh but but for sure we will have you in sri lanka no sooner borders open up thank you very much that was insightful that was fun um and and you promised it would be fun and it was uh, thank you very much anton over to you thanks a lot thank you thank you nigel we love you the chocolates on the way <laughs> um, a quick thank you to Nigel and Gordon. Sorry, sorry and <laughs> I might Gordon the chocolate. And then Gordon wants them too. Uh, we'll get you some as well. Thank you for keeping us engaged, gentlemen. In fits of laughter, no doubt, we have gained much from your time spent with us this morning. We are humble and certainly delighted to have had you on our panel this morning. On that note, web website links and links to the quiz have already been shared and what Nigel spoke about and also about his new book. It's a zoo around here, the new rules for better communication. We will have details of that on our soft social media shortly. Thank you, Vidusha, for being our host and for not falling off the chair.
even though we may speak about it confidently, what we heard this morning, maybe this is the time to genuinely accept that we will have to stumble through this period of uncertainty, but with courage and with confidence, while accepting that even our best laid plans may not come to pass. If listening to us today and throughout the last two weeks, you were able to have inspired insights, encounter poignant questions, sense that ever nagging question, what will it really, or what will really work for me? Well, then I think we have succeeded in our endeavors here. Our aim throughout the series was to explore this uncertainty with you and to enable you and assist you in some small measure to navigate what is undoubtedly the most challenging period in our lives. A final heartfelt thank you to the H1 team of Warriors, our technology partners throughout our series. We have been supported by an extremely capable and highly committed team led by Samat. Special thanks to Ashadi, Trevin, Irshad, and especially Lakmi, who has accommodated us tirelessly the last 12 days. These guys are our heroes. and They made this webinar possible. Thank you guys. A quick reminder to all our listeners this morning that all sessions will be available on our social media platforms. Do feel free to share. Signing off for the last time to everyone logging in from around the world. Good morning, good afternoon, and a good evening. Stay safe, stay productive.